What's up everybody, Ian here with Redline, and today I decided I wanted to do a video for you guys and share with you 10 tips that I wish someone had shared with me three years ago when I started building my 67 Nova, which is a highly custom muscle car build. I've basically learned a lot of things on this car by doing everything the wrong way, and so I'm hoping that I can share some of this with you in the hopes that it saves you some time, frustration, and money. Now before we get into tip number one, I would ask if you're finding my video for the first time, please click the subscribe button down below, follow my channel, I upload videos of the car all the time, as well as uh, click the thumbs up down below with YouTube, let YouTube know this is good content. I would encourage you to leave your comments and questions there as well, and be sure you turn on notifications so you can make sure you don't miss any of my future videos. My number one most important tip that I could give you if you're building your own custom car as I am is don't buy your parts unless you absolutely have to. Put it off for as long as possible. If you'll have a look at this picture here, you'll notice that I've got a Heights independent front suspension clip on the front of my car. However, on the car right now is a Detroit Speed front end. I ended up sending back my Heights front end because I determined that the ride height I wasn't going to be happy with and I wanted to go with a DSE front end. However, I got overzealous and about 18 months before it was actually necessary, I went out and bought a 15 inch Willwood brake kit for the Heights front end. I didn't need the kit, but I just had to see it on the car. You know, I was overexcited about it. I bought the kit. And now that I've run off and switched front ends, I don't need this kit. I've got a guy that's picking this thing up tomorrow for 250 bucks less than I paid for it. So I have learned this multiple times over and I could give you more examples just like this one where I've run off and I bought something too early, later realized that dead gummit, I bought the wrong thing, I need this, I need that. So don't buy your parts until it's absolutely time. Uh, hopefully that will save you a little bit of money when you run off and buy stuff too far in advance and you get something it turns out you don't need. Tip number two is kind of a derivative of tip number one, which is to say that sometimes procrastination is a good thing. Tip number two is don't fully weld something until you absolutely have to. And I'm gonna use this as an example, the seat mounts in my car. You'll notice that I've got a few random little metal parts here sitting on my table. These used to be the seat mounts for the driver's side front seat in my car. If you'll have a look at this shot right here, you'll notice that my current seat mounts that I've built into the car are just tack welded into place. They are not fully welded. Now, it goes to say in the situation that you're really doing yourself a big favor if you just tack weld it in, you don't fully weld it, and you leave it that way. You're allowing yourself the ability to have an epiphany that is not an expensive epiphany, which is exactly what happened with my seat mounts. I realized that my rear suspension arm that came off of my independent rear suspension system needed to tie into my seat mounts, and as a result, I had designed them wrong the first time, but thankfully they were only tack welded into place. It was very easy to get them out of the car and start over again. So tip number two is don't fully weld it unless you absolutely have to. Tip number three for building a custom car is get yourself a wheel simulation fitment tool. I use this one that's made by the folks at IFS. I think it was around a hundred bucks or so. I've also uh, got a link down below in the description to their website as well as another link where I do a full review video of that little tool. Uh, get yourself one of those so that you can make sure that you get the proper backspacing wheel width and wheel diameter so that your wheels fit your car like they're supposed to. In my case, I had a set of forge lines made for this thing that were nearly $10,000 dollars so it's a really expensive lesson to learn the hard way when you can get one of these things for you know a hundred bucks use it and uh, you know put it on eBay get 60 70 bucks out of it used that thirty dollars that you ended up wasting to make sure that you got the correct wheel for this car is money well spent uh, so I recommend getting yourself a wheel simulation tool those things will save you a lot of money in the future Tip number four is you absolutely positively have to use anti-seize compound on stainless steel bolts. I had no idea that this was an actual thing. I had these little threaded bungs made and bought myself some stainless steel bolts. And I did this so that I could thread these things in here and use these little straps that you see here, these little uh, you know uh, rubber straps to hold my fuel line in place. And I began to notice something kind of odd. 
I couldn't get the damn bolts out. I would lock them down really, really tight, you know, like you would any regular bolt, and then when you would go to pull it out, you couldn't get it out. So I started asking questions and come to find out stainless steel bolts will gall up inside the threads very, very badly and lock themselves into place. Uh, on this particular bolt right here on my hood hinge, I went to go pull that thing out. I had not put anti-seize compound on there and I noticed we get, that it started getting tighter and tighter as I was pulling this thing out for the very first time. I stopped and did my research, found out what was happening. I had to put PB Blaster on that bolt right there for two weeks straight. I'd turn it an eighth of a turn to the left, put some PB Blaster on it, come back the following day after it soaked in real good, eighth of a turn to the right, more PB Blaster, repeat the process. It literally took me two weeks to get one damn bolt out of this car because I had not used anti-seize compound. Tip number four is you absolutely have to use this stuff on your stainless steel bolts. My tip number five is frankly kind of counterintuitive. Most folks will tell you that when you get the car stripped down to the bare shell, go ahead and media blast the whole car. I disagree with that, and let me tell you why. What I think that you should do is when you get your car down to the bare shell, go ahead and evaluate as best you can what body panels you believe need to be replaced and need to be pulled off the car before you media blast it. Now, that's kind of difficult to do, but sometimes you can evaluate these things and realize, okay, well, the quarter shot, I don't need to media blast the car to come to the, to the conclusion that the rear quarter on the car is shot. So go ahead and pull it off as I have done here. In my case, the same can be said for the roof. And by doing so, when you get the roof out of the way, this is just a new roof sitting on the car, and you get the rear quarter out of the way, as this uh, instance is here, what it, that allows you to do is to media blast everything on the inside of the car that you couldn't normally get to. So if you were to pick up the roof of my car and look underneath it, all of this area up in here, which was rusted, I was able to get to that area and media blast it all and prime it all. So on the top side of my roof braces, in between the roof and the top side of my roof braces, all of that stuff has been taken down to bare metal and primed. And so if you tried to blast your car before you put those, you, you took those panels off, you would never be able to access those kind of areas. So get everything stripped off the car as much as you possibly can then media blast the car. That's tip number five. Tip number six is get yourself one of these PA or foam engine blocks. I'm going to put a link down below in the description where you can find these things. Um, this is my real LS3 with my real TR6060 transmission. And I have found that getting this, this real engine in and out of the car every time you want to check header clearance or oil pan clearance, something like that, is remarkably difficult when PA or makes these foam engine blocks that are the exact same thing, all the threaded inserts, they weigh nothing. Getting this thing in and out of the car makes building the car way, way easier. And again, kind of like a wheel alignment tool, when you're done with it, you don't think you're going to need it again, throw it on eBay, take a $100 loss, it's money well spent, get yourself a PA or foam engine block. That's tip number six. Tip number seven is realize the incredible importance of the location of the door. Now, door hinges have the ability to be adjusted quite a bit where I can raise this door up and down. I can tilt it this way or that way. I can move it forward or rearward. So what you want to do is before you run off and say, for instance, you take off your rear quarter, as I have done, it's terribly important that you make sure that your door is in the proper location. It's lined up with your rocker like you want it. It's also lined up at the front so that my rocker and my door end at the exact same point. This is terribly important because I've got to have this door where it really is supposed to be so that when I put my, my rear quarter back on the car, I'm going to reference it again against my door, which is referenced against my rocker. So as you're getting ready to replace something like a cowl, a fender, whatever, make sure that your door is adjusted exactly where it's supposed to be and leave it there until you get the other body parts put on the car because it all just kind of fits together like a puzzle. So that's tip number seven, locate your doors properly. 
Tip number eight is I recommend picking a plumbing supplier and sticking with that plumbing supplier. Uh, pick one guy right off the bat and then stay with them through the entire build. This naturally means that you want to pick them carefully. Uh, I did, frankly, what you shouldn't do. I started off just going straight to JEGS for my plumbing supplies, and then I switched and I jumped ship through the build. I went to the folks over at Auto Plum. I'll put a link down below to their website. A guy named Joe runs that place very very knowledgeable uh, big help more about them in the future in one of my other videos but the one of the reasons that I say this is if I were to take my JEGS connector here and I were to try and hook it up to some hose that I picked up from the folks at Auto Plum it doesn't fit uh, this is a rubber hose this is a PTFE hose and so now here I am stuck with JEGS fittings that won't fit my PTFE hose uh, so it's important that all of this stuff fits properly so choose one supplier stick with them if you look right here behind me you'll notice that I've just kinda haphazardly located my fuel regulator here on the uh, makeshift firewall and if you have a look up close in this shot you can notice here how the color difference between this blue this blue uh, this red and this red they don't actually match that's again because I, I ran off and started mixing fuel fittings when I started buying this stuff months ago uh, so I I'm gonna end up with you know different colors of fittings on my car so if you'll just you know go with one supplier from day one and stick with them everything will fit together properly all of the colors will be exactly the same that's tip number eight Tip number nine is regarding the endoskeleton. The endoskeleton is the system of bars, in my case here, some square tubing that holds the shell of the car together. Now, as you start removing things like the roof, the rear quarters, the floor, all of this, you're making the shell of the car very, very wobbly to where it can move on you. So it's terribly important that you weld a system of bars up inside of the car so that the shell does not move as you start removing things like the roof and the floor and things of that nature. The last thing that you ever want to have happen is you get this car put back together, everything's fully welded, you go to put the windshield in place, you got a quarter of an inch too much space on the left and a quarter of an inch too little space on the right and at that point you realize that your car has done one of these and you didn't know that it did it. So it's terribly important that you put an endoskeleton in your car if you are going to start removing and replacing big body panels on it. Now it is also worth mentioning in that one of my first videos I did my endoskeleton and I did it wrong. I actually put my bars to where they hooked in on the inside of the door jam. You'll notice today I can close my doors even though my endoskeleton is in the car. So I ended up having to tear out my first endoskeleton and completely redo it. I even came back after that and put in a section right here so that I could put my seats in the car. That way I could start building and designing the floor pans, the seat mounts, all of that. So I've made several modifications to this thing and I've learned build your endoskeleton very, very carefully, very well thought out, and damn sure don't do what I did and put it inside the door jam. That's a no-no. That's tip number nine. My number 10 tip, if you're building a custom car like I am, and assuming you are going to do braided lines like I'm doing, is get yourself one of these tools from the folks at Cool Tools. For the past month, I have been making my lines, basically trying to take my uh, you know, uh, little collars here and slide them over the uh, you know the braided line here without the braided line fraying that is terribly difficult to do a remarkable amount of time wasted as well as the number of times I've been poked in the thumb and it started bleeding because this braided line you know just goes right into you like a little hypodermic needle um, so much frustration in trying to do that stuff so I got online recently and uh, I found something to solve this problem the folks at cool tools make these little uh, tools you can kind of see in this shot right here that you just load the collar into one of these little things and basically what you've got here is like a little um, a funnel if you will so that you sandwich the two halves of this tool together and you have this funnel that basically does nothing more than funnels your braided line into your collar so that it's not allowed to fray and actually goes into the collar.
If you have a look up close right here, you'll notice that this line is just major frayed here on the outside of this thing. I'm going to have to declare defeat on the war against this braided line and lop off about an inch off of this and try again. But now that I finally got these little tools that showed up in the mail today, I'm really excited that I'm finally going to be able to build uh, braided lines and no longer struggle to get these things together because frankly, I'm just sick and tired of it. I'll put a link down below in the description to Cool Tools website. I'm also going to put a link down there to their YouTube video. It's kind of like a little quick educational video that'll show you how to use this thing. But honestly, it's just so simple that it's not necessary to even read the instructions. Okay, guys, that has been my 10 tips that I have learned I wanted to share with you guys about building a highly custom car as I am doing. Hopefully, everybody out there is learning from my mistakes. God knows I am making plenty of them. Again, if you don't mind, click the subscribe button down below and follow my build. I hope everybody is enjoying my updates on the car and learning something from my mistakes. I appreciate you guys watching. Thank you all and have a good one.